Okay, so I do want to welcome everybody to this webinar. It's the first of our summer series for Onward Hebrew. This one is about the big picture, and we're going to be taking a look at um, sound to print and creating a rich Hebrew environment. Please keep adding your names to the chat as, as you come in so that people can get to know who you are. We have um, several people who are part of this webinar with us. I want to introduce Stacy Schlein. Rabbi Stacy Schlein, who is one of the founding members of the Onward Hebrew Leadership Team, and she also works at the Jewish Education Center of Cleveland. She's going to be handling a lot of our chat stuff, and I'll introduce both Barb and Rachel in a minute. Um, let me do a quick run through of what we're going to be doing during this webinar. I want to do a contrast between uh, what is a, what I would call traditional Hebrew learning and um, onward, the Onward Hebrew approach. We have Barb and Rachel with us. I'll introduce them more later, later. But what we're going to be doing, what they're going to be doing is sharing some of their expertise, introducing sound to print to various stakeholders that they have. We will have time for um, questions and answers, and we will have time for three breakout groups. So I'd like to jump in and have us consider how Hebrew fits into the broader Jewish educational program that we have. Uh, and I, I asked you to bring some paper and a marker or something so that you can draw something, you didn't know you were drawing, so you can draw something that you can hold up to the screen. And when I ask about how Hebrew fits into your program, I want you to think about the importance of Hebrew, about how the structure might be and where Hebrew fits in that, or you could even think about it from the perspective of a child, how do they specifically um, experience uh, Hebrew? And I'm gonna share with you my example, which I was a congregational director many, many decades ago. And uh, in our program, let's see if I can get this up so you can kind of see it. In our program, I would say that uh, there was the Judaic time, the Jewish learning, there was Hebrew and they were very separate. And I was trying to think about tefillah, which I'm pretty sure we did, but I'm not sure that it really fit in our heads in Hebrew because at that time the cantor said, kids can't learn to chant. And we chanted prayers in the synagogue all the time, but kids can't learn to chant uh, the prayers until after they prove to us that they can decode the Hebrew. So that was kind of interesting in then. So you need to make your drawing bold enough that people can see it in your screen if you can do that. Take a minute and draw it. And then when you're done, hold it up to the screen and that will help me know kind of where we are with timing. How does Hebrew fit into the rest of your program? What's the interrelation? Oh, we have one up. Can you hold a little closer, Esther? Okay, there's an arrow between the Judaic and the Hebrew. Okay. Dell goes both ways. I mean, okay, wow. we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute, but yes, thank you. I just wanted to see where we are. And you were the first, so I got to say, look at this. <laughs> Oh my goodness, we have a, a full drawing from Rachel. We're gonna go into breakout rooms in a moment. You'll be able to share. Um, actually, we're gonna, Barb, if you can get ready, where's Barb? Oh, there she is. Um, sorry. Uh, if you can get ready to, to help the breakout rooms happen, here's what I want you to do. I want, you're gonna have about three minutes in the breakout room. I want you to introduce yourself briefly. No Jewish geography just briefly. Then I want you to share your diagram with the other people in your breakout room. Um, 
30 second description just to offer a little extra color to it. And then with the time that you have left, together start talking about what you notice between the, the various items. Okay? How many breakout rooms do you want? Uh, three people per breakout room. There's not a correction. There's not a. It's not broken up by threes. Do you want more or fewer people? <laughs> oh, so then let's let's count. Um, sorry, let me go back. Just Looking divide by three. You want three or four rooms? Yeah, there, there you go. Thank you. I'm going to pause the recording. Okay, um, so welcome back. I'm wondering, I, I know that was a very short period of time, if there was anything uh, that you discussed that would be interesting to share with others and if you might throw that into the chat. Did you see any commonalities, contrasts? Somebody had something that was a really amazing something. Oh, interesting. We had arrows showing the flow. Um, Stacy, what kind of flow were the, like most people had arrows, is that what you're saying? You can speak up. Um, yeah, so, well, yeah, two of our people had arrows showing a directional, like, relationship and um, how things were connected to each other and moved into the next piece over time. Okay, and Nami, I hope I keep saying your name right, that it stops by Bar Bat Mitzvah? Yeah, that it feels that uh, the connection is really, um, like Andrew actually said, that it stops. It stops with Bar Mitzvah, that it's like a tunnel to, this is, the, this is what uh, we do in Hebrew for like one reason. And as soon as we get to Bar Mitzvah age, uh, actually in our schools, it's ending with sixth grade, not even seventh grade. Uh, as soon as supposedly we prepare them for Bar Mitzvah, that's where it ends. I would love to see continuation, and that's why I do believe in you use uh, using it not just with learning uh, that philot, but doing more. Yeah, I, I love that perspective because you know, I keep thinking if, if, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. If kids are excited to learn Hebrew, and we we don't offer them an opportunity later in middle school or high school, then we've we've lost something that we've developed over time. Completely. Yeah. Um, so, so thank you for that. I want to um, acknowledge that as we move along in this webinar, that everybody has, who've, who's come to this has different uh, experiences, different perspectives, you're doing things differently. And so I have two things to suggest in relationship to how you're listening and participating in what's going on. One is you might consider how the language that I or Barb and um, Rachel or anybody else uses in the course of the webinar, how you might be able to take it and adapt it to your own setting. There's some things that we'll be talking about that I suspect people do know about. And the other is as noted for your note taking to think about what are the things that you hear that you might wanna start in your program what is it that you hear that makes you want to stop something in your program? And what are the things that you want to consider to keep thinking about? And uh, you could keep a chart that, that offers those three different things, start, stop, and keep thinking. And at the end, one of the things I'm going to ask you to do in the groups is to, if you have anything on your charts, to share that with others. So I want to start by talking about uh, what I would call traditional Hebrew learning, the traditional Hebrew school, if you will, that has been part of our lives for decades. It's not to say that it's monolithic. There are all kinds of options. And certainly if I went into any 
traditional program, I would see very different things in them, but there's certain commonalities that I wanna to contrast to Onward Hebrew. Um, even the name Hebrew School is confusing. I actually had somebody write to me today and said, I'd like to know more about this for my Hebrew School. And she was referring not to just Hebrew learning, but to the broader piece. And I think we confuse people when we talk about Hebrew learning, but it, everything we do is under this rubric of, of um, Hebrew school. The other thing that's semi-related is that I want to suggest that Hebrew has been what I would call part of a, like it's been a post hole. It's the way I describe the Hebrew learning in my program all those decades ago, that it was bounded by time and space. Hebrew was on Sundays from 9.15 to 10.15. Hebrew was on Tuesday afternoons from 4 to 5.30. And it didn't infuse, it didn't mix in, it didn't do all these other things. It was bounded. And, and that's how I think we used to see it. Hebrew in a traditional program, I would also say is skill-based that um, it focused yeah. a lot on decoding. And not only did it focus on decoding, it was many, many years of decoding, starting in kindergarten with letters and whatever else we did then and moved along. It was also, and, and I know that some of you may indeed be doing this now. I can't assume that everyone here is on the Onward Hebrew, um, is in the Onward Hebrew initiative. So I'm not saying this to make you feel badly. I'm just saying this is what I would call traditional. It's been print to sound that same thing with the decoding that we teach the letters and eventually come to the sounds of what we're doing. And it's been many, many years, as I said, of the decoding practice, including uh, which gets people stressed. Uh, so I'm just kind of curious uh, in the group, uh, how many of you may have yourself cried on the way to whatever your program was, Hebrew school, and how many of you, or you may have seen children come to tears over something in relationship to Hebrew? Anybody besides me? Yeah, it, it's, it's a narrative, it's a heritage that I'm hoping that Onward Hebrew will change and, and there's good news that it is making that change. Um, from the research on reading, and reading means that you're taking meaning from print. So we read in English, but many of us, many of our learners decode in Hebrew, just the, the phonics of it, if you will. Uh, and in reading research, it tells us that, um, this is obvious, children who only decode are not fluent readers. And what they're doing in that decoding process is burdening their working memory. It takes a lot of energy in order to just decode. And when that much of your working memory is taken up, then you can't focus on things like comprehension. So someone might work through and decode something and have no idea what they were working on. I want you to hold that thought because I'm gonna add that back in a different way when we talk about Onward Hebrew. So for me, Onward Hebrew promotes something bigger. And uh, I, I do hope that Onward Hebrew is not known as the initiative that delays decoding until a later grade. Like that is not what we're about. We're about this bigger idea of how one learns language. It approaches Hebrew learning from the perspective of what research tells us about language learning and that we need to build the sounds first before we get to the print. And when we do that, what we've done and what we've seen in all these programs is that Children are, are like, there's excitement and joy and there's energy around Hebrew. Actually into the chat, you can put some other adjectives from your program. Um, that is a huge narrative shift from the way people describe this traditional way of learning Hebrew. What was that movie? Was it called A Serious Man? The one that was filmed in Minnesota. Anyway, it was like a <laughs> death knell to what was going on with uh, Hebrew learning. Um, and, I, and so we talk about sound to print and we talk about sound to print from two perspectives. And I wanna start with a story about Dr. Lipsa Schachter who sits on my shoulder as my mentor in all of this. Um, we had a conversation a really long time ago. We had many conversations, but she said to me, Nahama, in the synagogue schools, Hebrew needs to really start with the language before we get to the 
the print, the decoding. And I said to her, but there's no time for that. We, we, can't, we, we can't possibly get there. And yet over time, we have figured out through Onward Hebrew that we can, and this is the macro piece of sound to print, that when we use Hebrew through movement, when we teach Jewish life vocabulary and use that on a consistent basis, especially when we do tefillah, so kids get the sounds of the prayers in their heads, then we are building the sounds in the way that Lifsa was pushing me to do all those years ago. And that's the macro perspective on this and how you, you implement those in your programs. Um, I want to return to this thing that I gave you about the reading research, the um, challenges of decoding and the energy expended in that process. It's, it's um, like what we're doing now is we're taking sounds, we're moving to decoding. Kids are matching ideally the sounds that are in their head with the print on the page. And so when we get them to chant and follow along the page, they are using the print to support themselves, but they're not decoding. I think that's gonna be probably the closest, we can prove this wrong within five years. That's probably the closest that we can get in our settings to this idea of, it's not reading, but this idea of more fluency because we're not depending on the decoding. Um, and I feel that when we do that, when we can do that, then doors open to us that their brains are not stressed and their brains are not overusing the working memory. And maybe we can get to more spirituality. Maybe we can get to more meaning making. Maybe we can get to more relationship building. I don't know, but I have a feeling that that clue from the reading research might help us as we think about what it means in our setting to take that aspect. All this is the micro piece of sound to print. When a child has the sounds in their head, or even an adult has the sounds in their head, what does the teacher need to do to help them match it to the print? That it's not cheating to do so, that there are things, there are techniques that a teacher can use. That's a whole nother webinar, but that's the macro and the micro. I'm gonna stop for a moment and just see if there are any quick questions or comments before I move into like the next little phase of what we're gonna do. You can just talk up. Or we can hold it. We'll hold it for a bit. So I wanna slide into this idea of a rich Hebrew environment. Um, when I talk about a Hebrew environment, we talk about environment or a learning environment. It's bigger than the space in which our kids learn to decode, which might be a classroom, it might be on Zoom, it might be outside, but it's, we can think about that as environment. But I wanna push us beyond to all the things that might be in our control in relationship to an environment that these kids might be in, both tangible and intangible. Um, and I'd like you to think about what that might mean and offer some examples, and this I would like to go into the chat, of a rich Hebrew environment. Think beyond the post hole that I gave you. What, what might a rich Hebrew environment look like? And let's see what comes up in the chat. Thank you, Stacy, for putting in the instructions. can name the obvious. I mean, I would even say a classroom with posters on the wall and things like that can begin the process of creating an environment. Think about your sanctuary, think about conversations, think of that's the intangible, think about broadly those things. So we do have a classroom with posters. What are we looking at? Ah, Jewish summer camp is a good one which takes us even out of the things that we might only control. Uh, maybe usage of a Hebrew, either sentences or words uh, that are part of the vocabulary that we would want them to know. And it's not just filah base, but make the connection to reality, to life. 
Right, so that they, they can do that. And that kind of ties in with what Rachel put in, teachers conversing with each other in Hebrew. Using Hebrew words that are part of the vocabulary that we want them to know. Thank you. Maybe using uh, music as part of uh, the teaching. That's a great example. Um, Cause music, like I have a, a two and a half year old grandson. And I know that when I sing Old MacDonald really slowly with him he can begin catching things that he can't get otherwise. See doer music, group names rather than grades like camp units. Using so, nature is a part of teaching uh, words in Hebrew, like, you know, in, when you go hiking in Colorado, we have many opportunities to go hiking. So using a hike is a, a, a way to, to teach Hebrew words in conversing in Hebrew. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And that, again, expands us out of our buildings and how we think about the learning. So here's what I want to do. I, um, I'm actually going to do this as a whole group and ask us a related question. So what do you, what do you think would be low hanging fruit related to it? If I said to you, I'd like you to create a richer Hebrew environment than you have. We have some examples, which would be easy for you to implement. And you might think of something else you want to implement and just open your mics and talk. Can I ask a question about what you mean by a rich Hebrew environment? Like, is that an environment where there's a lot of Hebrew, but the understanding of what those Hebrew words mean isn't necessary? Or is a rich Hebrew environment an environment where people in that environment feel there's a lot of Hebrew around and they know what it means? Like at camp, you know, a bunch of our units are named Bon, like a lot of camps, Jewish camps, their youngest unit is called Bonim. And I was just was on faculty at one of the camps and all those kids knew their unit was called Bonim, but I don't think they knew that Bonim meant builders. So what do you mean by a rich Hebrew environment? Well, you asked the question in relationship to whether or not people understand. So let me take that question and throw it to the group. Do people need to understand the Hebrew around them in order for that to be a rich, or let's even call it a richer Hebrew environment than what we have? I don't think so, because I think part of providing that environment is that over time, they will hopefully learn and ask questions. And, you know, I think that some of the things we do to, to create a rich Hebrew environment includes putting Hebrew labels on things in classrooms. And I don't expect our kindergartners to be able to read the English or the Hebrew, but they might ask, what does that say? Oh, that says Luach on the board. And make the connection. So I don't think they need to understand it for it to be considered a rich Hebrew environment. But a Hebrew environment, a rich Hebrew environment is not necessarily only being able to speak or read the Hebrew words. It can be also beyond uh, the language, like uh, a, something that a, incorporates um, history, ecology, and stuff like this that brings uh, a, a, integrates the Hebrew to other um, ideas or topics that relate to Israel and Hebrew. That's how I see the enriched Hebrew and well. Thank, thank you. I also think about in this, this uh, in relationship to kids need to understand uh, one of my colleagues said that her four-year-old daughter who went to synagogue every Shabbat uh, was overheard singing, like belting out Ain Kelohain in the bathtub. Like she was in an environment, she, this kid had no idea what it meant. She certainly could not have decoded it at her age, but by being in a place where she heard in this case prayers on a very consistent basis, that so I get for me, the meaning making is not necessary, but the question becomes then, you know, where we get to the meaning and where we don't.
So um, we're not going to do this now, but I'd like you to, to challenge you to think about uh, what uh, related to um, related to this question, like if you chose to take on a richer Hebrew environment, what would the challenges be? And, and how would you, like, what are they? And then what would you need to do to overcome them? But I, I do want to move us along to another aspect. Rich Hebrew environment is about building the sound somehow related to Hebrew. And uh, I want to introduce our two, uh, I call them E3s, educators with experience and expertise. This spring, I had conversations with, I invited anybody who was part of Onward Hebrew, the education directors, to have a conversation with me one-on-one -on -one about what was going on. I was just curious how the pandemic affected things, if people needed help and so on. And a number of them asked the question, I'm not really sure how to talk to my parents about what this Hebrew thing is. Like what is sound to print? What is onward Hebrew? And I had, as I said, several people. And then I was talking to Barb Shemansky and Barb said, oh, this is how I speak to my parents about onward Hebrew. So Barb is going to be talking to us about the, the parents as part of our stakeholders and how she talks to them. And in another conversation, Rachel Tishauer, both of them are in different parts of the country. Rachel and uh, Carrie Vogel, who were together in the conversation, said, oh, this is how we talk about it with our, I think you call them tutors and not teachers, but the people who do the teaching of Hebrew. So that's what Rachel is going to address. I'd like each of you to give a very brief introduction of yourselves. And as everybody is listening, again, to think about, are there things that come up that you might want to start? Are there things that you might want to stop? And there are things that you want to keep thinking about? Okay. So, Barb. Um, so let me actually start by giving you like a super, super brief on one foot overview of our program, just so when I refer to things, you're not stuck on what does that mean? Um, <laughs> but you can you can focus on the bigger picture. So, um, so I'm Barb Shemansky. I'm the director of the School for Living Judaism at Temple Beth Shalom in Miami Beach, Florida. We are a large reform congregation. Um, I have just started my sixth year here. Um, and in the halfway through my first year, I did a visioning session with our committee and discovered that um, where we want to be and where we were were very different ends of the spectrum. And so um, we actually revamped our entire program, including our approach to Hebrew, and we adopted um, Onward Hebrew, and we really just <laughs> right from the beginning. Um, so as you might imagine, that was definitely a challenge in selling to our parents. Um, so um, what we do is um, we actually have a Shabbat morning program. So often if I say Saturday or Shabbat, you would probably replace that with Sunday um, when you're talking to your parents. Um, our Hebrew through movement happens during our Saturday morning sessions for K through five. Um, and I have two facilitators who are our specialists in Hebrew through movement. So they, um, they push into the class. Well, we've done actually both. They push in or the kids actually go to their spaces. We pushed in this year because of COVID. Um, we don't want the kids walking around the building as much. Um, we don't have really a formalized Jewish like vocabulary because I have teachers who are actually just really great about incorporating um, Hebrew vocabulary in with with their lessons, um, and that is part of our curriculum guide also is to um, really emphasize those Hebrew words connected to holidays or ideas. Um, we have a, a wonderful tefillah program. It's actually a family tefillah experience for our first half hour on Shabbat morning, and it is very Hebrew rich. We use the Mishkan tefillah for youth, so even though the kids can't read, necessarily read the Hebrew, they are able to look at it on the page and at least kind of start to become familiar with those symbols. Um, and then our, our, you know, moving toward reading or decoding um, program starts in fourth grade. They're not really decoding yet. They're, uh, you know, introduced to the letters. They get like kind of the concept of the vowel symbols, but they're not really necessarily, um, you know, super focused on that. There's a lot of um, 
conversational Hebrew. They learn a lot of, um, you know, basic phrases and that kind of thing to kind of keep their excitement level going. And then we jump into um, more formalized decoding learning in fifth grade and sixth grade. Um, and interesting that, that it was brought up that it seems to stop before B'nai Mitzvah, because actually this year we are going to, um, we're revamping our seventh grade curriculum, and it's actually going to be modern Hebrew with the reading elements so that they continue their, their Hebrew learning, regardless of where they are relative to their B'mitzvah. Um, so that's kind of the overview. Um, so when we were moving to this, um, this approach, um, as I'm sure you all have experienced um, in your own move, the parents were like, you know, freaking out. Like, what do you mean? You're not gonna, you know, my kid's in third grade and they're not gonna read Hebrew. Um, of course, I got the least amount of pushback from the non-Jewish parents who didn't know from Hebrew school. <laughs> they were like, great, whatever you do is fine. Um, <laughs> but those who grew up with Hebrew school, and I would say even more so from those who grew up in a more conservative background who had Hebrew, you know, Sunday and Tuesday and Thursday, and all of a sudden we were moving to like, you know, no days of set Hebrew per se. Um, they were really, I mean, to the point where some of them were like, I'm not even sending my kid next year with this new program that you're introducing, which like was weird to me because I'm like, well, now they're not getting anything at all. But um, <laughs> so um, what really, um, got me very intentionally thinking about how to talk to parents was um, during that summer uh, prior to our switch, when a dad called me and said, well, I have some questions about this Hebrew school where you're not gonna be teaching Hebrew anymore. And I said, we are gonna be teaching Hebrew. We're just not gonna be teaching Hebrew the same way that we have been. Um, and I realized like, oh, I really need to, you know, think about how this is being communicated because if that's what's out there in the community that we're not gonna teach Hebrew anymore, then that's, that's wrong, right? So, um, so what I've realized over the last few years is that I really um, need to focus on telling parents what we do as opposed to what we don't do. So I really now try to stay away from language like, oh, we don't do uh, you know, what they do in a traditional Hebrew school, right? But rather, this is our approach to Hebrew that you know, when your child comes on Saturday morning, they're gonna get this and you know, this is, we have the philo, we have right, and really like emphasizing what we what we do, um, and and explaining really what the sound to print philosophy is, and I really go into detail about it. You know, mimicking the um, the way that we naturally acquire language, and that we hear it and speak it before we read it and write it. That you know, similar to like your children were born, and then they didn't really start reading until they were about five, but they had a great command of the English language by the time they were five. Um, that we really do the same thing. We really introduce Hebrew in kindergarten. Um, you know, some of our kids who come from our early childhood programs have obviously had exposure before that, but you know, that they we really integrate it um, in a really meaningful and intentional way, starting in kindergarten, and then you know, four or five years from now is when they will start writing or reading. Um, so you know, when I frame it that way, they really um, it seems like they really get it. Um, I really emphasize how fun Hebrew through movement is, um, that the kids really enjoy it, that it's socially constructed, that you know, if they miss a week because of a birthday party or a family trip or they're sick or whatever, that um, you know, it's fine, they just jump right in and they catch on and uh, you know, their friends can help them because it's designed that way, it's not cheating, there's no cheating in Hebrew. Right? Um, and um, you know, generally, especially with new parents who are, you know, calling to inquire about our program. Um, generally, when I really emphasize that and how much the kids love the Hebrew and that they really find joy in learning the language, the parents are like, oh, oh my gosh, that sounds so great, right? Because this is not the experience most of them had learning Hebrew growing up or the experience I had. Um, so, um, yeah, so I really like try to emphasize all of the really positive things. And since we've been doing it for several years, I have... Um, you know, some anecdotes that I can share also, um, you know, one that I, that popped up this past year that I um, have been sharing frequently is um, I was in a, I was sitting in a sixth grade Hebrew class and the sixth grade, this sixth grade Hebrew teacher happens to be one of my Hebrew through movement facilitators on Saturday morning. So he said to the kids, um, do you remember, they were studying the Vaya Hafta and he said to them, do you remember how to say to sit? from Hebrew through movement. And they all said, yeah, Lashevet. And he said, okay, well, look at this phrase. 
And he showed that, you know, he pointed out that it translates to when you sit in your house. And it was like the light bulb went on and they were like so excited to make this connection between, you know, what they thought was just kind of like a fun, like, oh, of course we're gonna learn how to say to sit because like we learned how to say to stand. So we have to sit back down, right? Um, and this prayer that they know really well because they've been going to tequila all these years, um, you know, and really kind of seeing how the language sort of connects and, and clicks in that way. Um, so um, I also, I just finished my bulletin article for August um, and I was, um, I was like not really sure what I was gonna write about and then the comma inspired me and I said, oh, I'll, I'll kind of give an update on how Onward Hebrew is going. And so I included at the end that, um, I, you know, that all of these things, like we've seen all of these really positive things and really also wanted to emphasize that it does not mean that our children are going to be able to read very quickly. <laughs> um, and that came from a comment from a parent a couple of months ago when she said, oh, my kids didn't really seem to know the four questions this year. And I was like, really? Um, and so she said, you know, so my sixth grader read it and he read it perfectly, but it was very painful to like sit there. And I'm like, okay, but you just said he read it like totally correctly and he decoded it so like to me that's a win right um so i really wanted to emphasize um without really putting in these words sort of like the myth of fluency that by teaching them to decode and by having all of this background but they're still only coming a couple hours a week they're not going to read like they read english but that the trade-off for that is that they're finding a lot of joy and connection with the hebrew language and that that's going to really carry forward with them for many, many years um, and will, um, you know, really serve to help them connect with the language of our people and to really kind of be an, an integral part of their Jewish identity formation. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll come back and have questions later, but that was great. Um, Rachel, what can you offer us? Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Tishauer. I work at Kihila Israel in Pacific Policy, which is in Los Angeles. Um, I have been working here for nine years. I'm finishing my fifth year in this role as assistant director in our religious school. And I also will tell you briefly about our programs so that you have some idea. Um, we have two different programs for our younger students. Um, we have a traditional on-site program for K through six that meets here Sunday mornings. And then we also have a camp-based program for third through sixth graders that meets off-site at a camp a little bit longer day, less frequently. So they meet about once or twice a month throughout the school year. Um, and that provides a, a challenge to teach Hebrew because we have kids who are here every week and we have kids who we see once a month and um, so we moved several years ago to solely teaching Hebrew through one-on-one -on -one tutoring. So every single third through sixth grade, I should say formally teaching Hebrew, um, every third through sixth grade student gets a tutor and they meet once a week for 30 minutes um, throughout the entire school year to learn Hebrew formally. We also have Hebrew for Movement, Jewish Life Vocabulary, Tequila for all of our students in all grades every time they are here or at this camp program. So lots of different Hebrew coming in, but the formal way is through one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And the biggest reason we do that is because all of these kids are now able to learn at their own pace and without the pressure of peers around them who are either learning faster than them and so it's intimidating or learning slower than them so it's boring having that opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one lets them be in charge of their Hebrew learning in a really unique way. So one of the things that um, we tell our tutors the um, go back one second so we have leveled off our Hebrew program in a way that um, kids move through different levels and they it's called Hebrew ninjas. So it's sort of like earning karate belts. Um, the first is learning all of that and all of our students, no matter what grade they start with us, that's where they begin learning all of that. Once they have mastered all of that, which to us means they know the name of the letter and the sound it makes, then they can start 
decoding and learning pairs, which for us typically ends up around fourth, fifth grade, but again, depends when they start. Um, so when, when they get to learning prayers, the first group of prayers they learn are ones that they have heard for most of them a million times before. We start with one sentence prayers that we think are very easy to read. And like we said, they have heard. It's putting the sounds they know. We do um, Hamotzi, Lohadli Khmer, Shema, Barhu. They've heard them over and over and over again, some of them since they were in preschool. And then it's connecting them with these letters that they've now learned as well. Um, so one of the things we tell our tutors when they start working on prayers is when you are teaching a new prayer, you read it to the student first. And as you're working through it, you read a line and have them repeat it or read a word and have them repeat it. And there's nothing about that that is cheating. That's how we learn to teach them. They can hear it and then repeat it and connect the sounds they're hearing to the letters and the words that are on the page in front of them. Um, another thing we tell them is not to let kids stumble. I mean, there's a fine line between letting them work through it, especially as they are decoding, and letting them sit there struggling, feeling like they're failing. And so if they are, you know, clearly sounding things out and working through it, give them time to do that. But as teachers, your job is to teach them what that word is. Don't, don't sit there and let them stare at a word for two minutes. Just give it to them and have them repeat it. Um, it's, it's more important to build confidence in their reading ability than for them to be able to do it on their own, especially the first time they're looking at it. So the other thing, as I mentioned, that the prayers are leveled, the only way our students can move from one level to another is to test with me. And I'm the one who oversees all of it. That way it is clear and concise and one person and it's not each tutor saying, oh yeah, I think you're ready. It's, you know, on one level for the whole synagogue. And I too, even when I'm testing kids, if they say a word wrong or they're stumbling and they're not sure, I give it to them. Even during this test, we don't, there's no failing our tests. We just, there are times where I said, I think you need to work on this a little bit more, go back with your tutor and then let's try again. But, um, but I give them the word. And the one thing I do is I make sure they repeat it. I'm not filling in the word for them as they're reading and they get to just move on with the rest of the prayer. I wanna hear them go back and, and say that line again with the word that they heard. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention, and, and this goes, we say it to our tutors, we say it to our families, we say it to our students often and over and over again, is that memorizing Hebrew prayers is not wrong. It's not cheating. It's actually super normal and totally acceptable. And back in the olden days before prayer books existed, that's how everybody learned Hebrew prayers is they all memorized it and taught it via sound to to students and um as I'm sure you all know when we become the name it's then we read from the Torah it's memorization you know there's no vowels in the Torah we're not reading we're recognizing the letters and we're connecting it to the sounds we memorized we were joking earlier some of us on cassette tapes some of us on CDs some of us on iPods depending on when we had our B'nai Mitzvah, right? But we all hear it and then memorize it. And so I also tell our tutors and our kids and our parents, there's nothing wrong with memorizing these prayers. Um, it's, it's how we learn Hebrew for generations. Thank you both to Barb and uh, Rachel, I'm going to open the floor to questions if people have them. Uh, let's start with questions and then we'll get to comments. And, and I'm also going to post in the chat an article that uh, talks about some of this history of reciting prayers rather than reading them. Okay, questions for either?
any comments for either? Like I'm, I'm actually taking oh, by. Okay, go ahead. Let me just finish this, and then we'll piggyback yours on. Um, I'm taken by some of the challenges. Barb talked about parents who um, who push back and who don't like. You're starting with this blank slate of like what, what, and also for Rachel for teachers who who may also wish to push back on things. So I just noted that as a commonality. Esther, do you want to throw something? Yeah, in? I I have two questions or comments. So uh, at what point uh, when we start teaching the uh, kids to read at grade four or five, uh, do we actually get to any fluency in reading towards a bar with mitzvah? And where does the understanding of tefillah come into this? Uh, when do we teach keywords that uh, uh, bring the tefillah more to something that we can identify with or understand better than just memorizing and singing by road, okay? Um, and my other question is actually a, a bigger question. Um, we heard about uh, teaching first the language and then going to reading. And what about this happening simultaneously? Uh, teach, teaching the language, uh, but also um, introducing the reading at the same time. And there are some there are some programs to do it. Yeah. So first of all, I want to say we do have a, a webinar coming up on tefillah and prayer goals, and it may be that that's where some of that prayer question can get answered a little more deeply. Um, yes. Uh, Rachel, you want to say something? Sure. So um, when I, I provide prayer sheets for each of our prayers to both students and tutors, and at the top, it has a short description of the prayer. That's what we want them to know about the prayer. So it says something. So on Shema, it says, you know, one of the most important words in this prayer is Echad at the end of the first line. It means that there is only one God. Um, there on the Lahalik Nero blessing, it says this is the first of the three blessings we say on Shabbat. So there's teaching involved. And when I give them those prayer tests, like I mentioned, um, one of the things I have them do is tell me something about this prayer before they read it to me. So they're obligated to, to understand what they're saying and what they're reading more than just reading the prayer for me. Um, and then our tequila is a is a teaching tequila service. We don't do the same prayers every week like a traditional service. We mix it up. Some weeks we do different prayers, and each time we're teaching about the prayer um, to all of our students, K through twelve. I want to yeah. say something, if I may. Um, I actually wanted to get on this uh, uh, webinar because uh, I wanted to hear more about uh, the fact that, uh, you know, and I read before many times about, uh, you know, the reading, um, a, how people acquire reading, what you shared with us, Nechama. And the truth is uh, I'm a Hebrew coordinator. And one of the things that I've been working on is curriculum. And we, in our schools that I'm involved, uh, really doing uh, the, what we're calling the old way. One of the, the two questions that I have is being um, a, uh, speaking um, a different languages, I realize that when I listen to words that I don't know what they are, when I listen, I could, pick, I could pick up a lot of mistakes. It means I, I don't hear what maybe somebody else hear. How can we, if we're doing something that we're doing uh, sounds to print, how are we avoiding the, the, um, those mistakes that kids will pick up 
uh, you know, uh, during when they learning words, you know, so this is one question. My other, I know that I tried a uh, few times to, uh, not few times, but many times we teaching the kids words. Uh, like I love the, uh, I don't remember who said that, uh, but I think Barb was saying about the word Lashevet. And then they found out that it's actually, be, uh, you know, in the Vahavta and they kind of, I found that kids do not remember the words. Uh, and these are words that, you know, we have been repeating and repeating and they could not make the connection, you know. So uh, so this is how do we, um, I would say the word, how do we attack those uh, two um, different uh, situations? So, so I'm going to give very brief answers because we're coming very close to the end. And I do want to make sure that we, we come back around. First, I want to say that there is a decoding webinar and that's where these kinds of things will be addressed. And I made sure to make notes of what you said. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we know that when kids learn things by heart, they learn funny things. My, um, my sister in the Pledge of Allegiance, some line was for Ouija Fink or something. I have no idea what, but you just hear something. So the question is how you help kids slow down and see what it is. And also if I take what Rachel was saying of having uh, the teachers give the words first, like for Mishmaro Tehem is one of those really difficult words. And chances are kids learned it wrong, but if the teacher breaks it off into one, then, then it may be that we can help with that. Lifsa also talks about helping kids divide words into syllables according to the Hebrew system, not the English one. So that's a whole nother piece too. The other thing with vocabulary, um, I don't know, Nami, if you're doing Hebrew through movement, but what we find in general is that with Hebrew through movement, as compared to saying, here's your list of eight words that you need to remember, that the words get in the kishkas deeper, and, and yet we still have to help them make the connection that if a child is learning the four questions using Hebrew through movement, that at the end of the lesson, they need to chant that part of the four questions with the words that they heard so that immediately those words are like, oh my gosh, or um, Yotzer Or, there's like eight words that we recommend learning that you chant it afterwards and then you help them understand, oh, that's a word I just learned and know because Hebrew through movement gets it into their kishkas. Um, Stacy, I know needs to pop off a minute. Uh, I do, do want to say that Stacy is going to be facilitating the next webinar, which is about Hebrew through movement, and we'll also take a higher level approach to that. We assume that people are using Hebrew through movement, and then we'll, we'll help fill in that, that advancing piece of Hebrew through movement. Um, I do want to take, we have three minutes, though, before we go. I do want to see what the things are that some of you might be thinking about as compared to um, like, let's not talk about the start and stop, but like, what are the things you're thinking about at the moment as a result of some of the things you heard? I saw people taking notes at various times. Just quick answers. I would like to know about more successes, you know, because as I said, I'm so, um, so hang up on one direction, I would love to hear about more success. You know, people that like, for example, somebody like uh, Barb, eh, I would love to talk to you more if I can, and to see, you know, um, to hear more, you know, examples and stuff like that, you know. So you're welcome. One of the ways you can learn about that is to uh, go into the Onward Hebrew Facebook group and post that question. Like, uh -huh. what, what are people seeing? And I will help stir that okay. up so that they do it. The two links that Stacy put in before she needed to yeah, run, just... um, each of those has various stories intermingled and uh -huh. you, you might be able to find that. And the first one has elements of webinars where other people are talking and that may help mm -hmm. also. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I'd say also the definition of success might be different, even with, you know, my of definition course. of success and my canters are probably a little bit different, even though we work together, right? Of course. It really depends on the goal. That, that's yeah. a great What you're point. trying to achieve. Yeah. But I would be happy to talk to you about that. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. I know that there's another webinar that the uh, Association of Reformed Jewish Educators is starting at two. So I'm going to close this off here. I very much thank Rachel and Barb for sharing their experience with us, helping us think about how we talk to others about this bigger picture that we're trying to create, because unless other people have the bigger picture and join us in on that, it's really hard for them to follow through on the things that we ask them to do. Probably should have started with that statement, but I'm ending with that statement. So thank you all for coming. I'm happy to stay on for a bit if anybody has any additional questions or comments or anything. And